Hello, uh, welcome to our third podcast for special topics in psychology. My name is Isaiah, serving as content creator of the club. And my name is Banjo, currently serving as the president of this club. And today we'll be talking about instructional psychology in contribution to education. Today's guest, we have Elder Osgador. Elder, can you please introduce yourself? Um, so my name is Russell T. Osgothorpe, and I'm married to Lola Osgothorpe, and we have five children and 23 grandchildren and one great-grandchild just born last year. So uh, that was exciting for us. And we live in Provo, Utah. I was a professor at BYU for a long time and uh, retired several years ago, and then we filled a one-year mission to BYU Hawaii where we taught religion and then second semester I also taught special education because they needed a teacher for that course. So that's a brief introduction and in the church I've had lots of church uh, leadership experience and so um, our most recent calling was in the actually in the Hawaii temple where we served as temple ordinance workers and I served as a sealer. And um, then before that in Provo temple, before that we were temple president and matron in the Bismarck, North Dakota temple. And so that was for three years. And then we also served from 2003 to 2006 as mission president in the Dakotas in the same area where we served as temple president uh, 15 years later. <laughs> So awesome. Yeah. yeah. You had the several calling and not to mention you were the former Sunday school general president. Then yeah. I was also called to be a general president. Yeah. Sunday school general president in 2009 to 2014. That's cool. And currently our general Sunday school president is other Todd Callister who replaced you during that time. Uh, he, he was released last April and uh-huh. yeah, now we have a new uh, Sunday school general president. So, so the Sunday School General President serves for five years, as, as do all the organization presidents. So after five years, yeah, he, uh, Elder Collister was released last April, I believe. Yeah. Wonderful, wonderful. Well, great to, to know all of your backgrounds, Elder. You must be very experienced to help us with our journey to in psychology and also in the church. Yeah. The question is, what made you decide to take psychology? So... I'm not sure when my interest in psychology started, but um, I actually, I think it was on my mission when I was 19 years old. Mm -hmm. Before going on my mission, I was thinking of actually majoring in music. And during my mission, I thought, you know, I am not sure what I'm going to do with music as a career. And I probably am not going to be a teacher of music in the schools. I I had decided probably that was not going to be my career. And I'm not sure what uh, kind of stimulated my interest during my mission in psychology, but I think it was working with so many people in a different culture and also working with companions who were of my own culture that sometimes I had a hard time understanding. (laughs) (laughs) why they were doing what they were doing or why they felt the way they felt uh and as as you know on a mission you get very close to people and you you really see their best moments and their not so good moments and so then you start to wonder what causes human behavior why do people Mm -hmm. behave the way they do why Mm -hmm. do they think the way they do um and what causes certain people to have certain emotions so those things probably happened on my mission and then i came back and enrolled at BYU Provo and uh, decided to major in psychology. And I was, I, I, you know, I was glad that I did. It was, it was a positive experience. Wow, wow. Um, that means mission is just a life-changing moment for you to realize that you yeah. are in psychology. Yeah. Great, great, great. Um, yeah, since you were interested in psychology and you became author with several books too, right? Um, and we have some questions about instructional psychology. Why and how you get involved with instructional psychology of it? Oh, that was interesting. So I did my bachelor's in psychology. Then I did a master's degree in school psychology. School psychology is where you get hired as a school psychologist in the schools. And you help young people 
uh, in this case, I was working mostly with elementary age children who had emotional problems mm -hmm. and intellectual problems, um, learning disabilities, all kinds of problems. And I was helping as a school psychologist to diagnose those problems. Uh, I was doing that as an intern while I was working uh, on my master's degree. And one day a professor came to me in instructional psychology and technology. And he said, do you want to spend the rest of your life diagnosing problems? Or do you want to spend the rest of your life helping to solve those problems? Wow. <laughs> I said, you know what, I think I would rather spend more of my time solving the problems because oftentimes the test results that I would give as a school psychologist, I would take those results to a teacher and the teacher would say, yes, we already knew this. Um, mm -hmm. Well, that was after spending all this time giving all these tests, the teachers already kind of knew what the problem was. I, I wasn't, I, I didn't feel like I was really helping the child as much as I would like to. So, um, instructional psychology um, and technology usually is working with adults, mm -hmm. not with children. It can apply also to children and youth, but um, then I decided to pursue a PhD in instructional psychology and technology, and then became very involved in working with programs, oftentimes to help people with disabilities. So. Um, my first faculty position was at the National Technical Institute for the Deaf in Rochester, New York, where college students who had hearing impairments were registered in the same college as um, hearing students. And then I had the responsibility to help those young adults who had deafness succeed in their learning uh, in a regular actually a very prestigious um, university called Rochester Institute of Technology. So sometimes they were sitting right next to some very challenge, you know, very competitive students uh, and, mm -hmm. you know, they didn't have hearing. And so, uh, cool. yeah, so we developed programs to help them. I spent about four years developing programs to help young deaf adults and yeah, then came back to BYU after that. <laughs> Yeah, that guy questioned you about like what what do you want to do or like you just want to be um, um, focusing on diagnosing or instead of um, helping to help you to decide to get yeah. instructional psychology. That's yeah. just awesome. Like what you said on the instructional psychology that it more most of the things that you do in instructional is about fixing the problem and um, knowing about what you should do about this problem. I think that is very awesome and interesting to do as a career. But with that, how does it differ from other psychology? So there's just there are lots of sub-disciplines in psychology. So there's developmental psychology that looks at how a child develops. There's abnormal psychology that looks at emotional disorders in people. Um, there's um, educational psychology, which is a very broad mm -hmm. uh, area in psychology that looks at uh, learning and teaching. And then there's instructional psychology and technology, which is even kind of a piece of educational psychology, which says, how can we help that the way I used to describe my discipline was how can we help, help people learn better, cheaper, faster. So for example, if we've got to train missionaries in a new language, how can we help them learn that language better, more effectively, mm -hmm. at less expense, faster mm -hmm. how can they come out it, one day the general authorities came down to the mtc and they said we want to see if you can teach newly called missionaries twice as much language in half the time mm -hmm. Ooh, this is <laughs> difficult how are we going to do this those of you you know who have studied a foreign language how yeah. are we going to help them learn a foreign language twice as fast but speak it better yeah you know? So that's where instructional psychology comes in and says, how do people learn um, and how can we help them learn better? I, when I was called as Sunday school general president, I came home one day and told my wife uh, after I'd been meeting with lots of people in the church office building, I said, most people do not understand how people learn. Mm -hmm. That sounds like a simple thing, but 
learning is a complex matter. It, it involves all kinds of aspects of one's person, mm -hmm. how you think, how you feel, how, your level of interest, your motivation, your uh, natural ability that you bring to the task. So um, we had to spend a lot of time talking about how people learn. Some people, for example, have a hard time understanding why when they, even newly called mission presidents, they have to help newly called mission presidents understand that when they teach a principle, it doesn't automatically get applied the next day by all the missionaries. Missionaries learn that when they teach somebody the word of wisdom, it doesn't automatically mean the next day their investigator is going to start keeping the word of wisdom. It's right? a process, yeah. It's a process. It's, it's process. learning, and a it takes a lot of effort, and yeah. <laughs> it, on the part, particularly on the part of the learner, and. So focusing on how people learn and how to help them use their natural motivation, their natural gifts and talents to acquire the kinds of skills and talents they want to in the future, that's a challenging endeavor. And that's kind of what instructional psychology and technology is. Oh, that's the same thing. That's something special about instructional psychology. You are helping the learners to kind of learn more. I mean, to learn right. faster and right. become more efficient. That's cool. Exactly. And um, right now we'll be asking about your career path, Elder. So, um, I mean, one one or two of our listeners, or like some of our listeners, will be might or might might be interested with educational psychology, and they want to pursue the same path as you did. And my question is, what are the paths um, you have to take to be an instructional psychologist? Okay. Um, so. Usually, you need to have a graduate degree. So mm -hmm. uh, there, there are various institutions, a number of universities that offer both masters and doctoral programs in instructional psychology, or in, it's called various things. It might be called instructional design and technology, mm -hmm. instructional technology, instructional psychology, instructional psychology and technology. <laughs> you know, the various different departments and disciplines yeah. around the country, but. They're all basically focused on how do we help people learn and how do we use technology in the process to speed up and make learning more effective. So um, career paths. So my own career path was um, starting, I got my degree at BYU Provo, and then I was uh, appointed as a faculty member at the National Technical Institute for the Deaf, which is with the Rochester Institute of Technology in Rochester, New York. So I was there for about four years. And then uh, BYU asked if I would return to BYU on the faculty there. So then I became a faculty member, a researcher in actually an institute called the McKay Institute. And then I uh, became a regular faculty member uh, at the University of BYU. Um, but there are lots of other career paths in my field. So uh, for example, if you go up to the church office building, you're going to find many people with master's degrees and PhDs even in uh, my field. Um, and so in church education system and the seminary system, there are people with PhDs in instructional psychology and technology in the curriculum department, uh, the priesthood and family department, um, missionary department, uh, I'm probably the temple department, but I can't think of anybody right now in the temple <laughs> department, but, but there are, um, people all over who in our discipline, if you look at the MTC, yeah. uh, a number of the directors at the MTC have PhDs in our field, the managing director of the priesthood and family department at uh, the church office building has a PhD, was one of my students. Um, so if you look at some of the things that the church developed in the last decade or so, like mm -hmm. Mormon messages and Mormon.org and on and on, those were all developed in part mm -hmm. by graduates of our program at BYU. So that's one uh, career track. Um, but other career tracks, they can work for the military. Mm. The military hires lots of instructional designers. And wow. then uh, you can also 
work on the private sector side in business. So if you look at any large corporation, Apple Computer, mm -hmm. uh, HP, uh, Microsoft, um, but any Ford Motor Company, it doesn't matter. You look at any large corporation, they all need people who have expertise in training and design of training so that they can help train their uh, employees effectively. So we've had a number of our graduates take, go into the private sector and um, they might work for an accounting firm who's developing um, training materials for to train accountants, or they can work in the church developing materials for a curriculum for the church or military training soldiers or <laughs> so oh. the, the um, that there's just a vast variety of mm -hmm. occupations that people can go into also in public schools they could work as the technology director for a whole school district or something like that so it's very broad yeah. very broad yeah it's it's what the, you said it's everything that associate with learning it could could apply instructional psychology right that's exactly right Isaiah that any any corporation you know at every corporation if you look at it every corporation has a huge um, demand for training mm -hmm. so every time they produce a new widget of whatever of any kind they've got to have somebody trained to fix it somebody trained to give technical assistance somebody mm -hmm. trained to install it somebody trained you know is like now you, you look at what YouTube has done for uh, helping us fix things around the house, for example, you know. <laughs> all of the uh, tutorials are in YouTube now. <laughs> that's right, they're all in there. And when you go to them, you'll see some of them that are really well done and some of them are terribly poorly done. Yeah. And so you have to watch it five times to understand what they're talking about. <laughs> okay, Heather, that, that, that's interesting. I, would, uh, I just want to ask, I'm just curious about on getting a uh, master or how do you call it a uh, graduate uh how do you say it? program graduate uh, program do you need to be a psych psych major or that's a good question uh you can major in anything okay you can major in swahili and major in <laughs> <laughs> yeah you can major in music or you can major in the arts humanities whatever and then you can pursue a graduate degree so usually in in our field so uh, our department at byu provo um, does not require that you major in psychology or education or anything like that to mm -hmm. be accepted into the program it's awesome it's very flexible um are there a lot of institutions that offer the um, graduate program for this kind of um, field of psychology yeah that that's can, a good can you question name some other <laughs> If you know oh, that. yeah, there, there are lots of institutions. So, uh, so I'm trying to go from west to east. So San Diego State um, has good programs uh, in, in our field. Uh, Utah State has mm -hmm. good programs. Um, University of Indiana, Florida State, the University of Georgia, um, Syracuse University, um, boy, but now, well, Boise State has a very fine program in uh, uh, instructional technology. I would, I would say that now there's, a, there's an article that one of the faculty members in our department just wrote mm -hmm. looking at all the departments of uh, instructional psychology and technology in the nation. Mm -hmm. And um, yeah, Rick West is his name. Would it be published or? Yeah, it's published. So you oh, can okay. look up. Uh, Rich, uh, Richard West uh -huh. and uh, Departments of Instructional Psychology and Technology. And that'll pop up an article that will give the whole list of all the institutions and their relative strength, you know, how strong they are in. So when you're going into a graduate program, for example, you want to go into a program where the faculty are actively publishing uh, the research in that area, in that field because you're going to be working with them to investigate questions and publish research. So um, it kind of gives a, uh, an evaluation in a sense of all the departments. So that would be a good source if somebody was interested in pursuing a, 
graduate degree in our field, they could just go to that article and say, hey, I, I think Georgia would be a good place for me. I think it'd be yeah, good. Yeah, yeah, that is exciting. Okay, uh, I really like what you said, Elder was uh, for Like for me, I am a uh, senior student in psychology. And what can you, uh, what tips can you give me to prepare for a graduate program in instructional psychology? Okay, well, I, I love questions like this. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I've had lots of students come to me in the past and ask these, these kinds of questions because there you are, a senior. I was just talking to a student at BYU Provo here at, in the swimming pool <laughs> and uh, he's, he's graduating in computer science. And I said, what are you gonna do? And he says, well, I might do this, I might do that. You know, he's still wondering what he's gonna do, whether he's gonna go on for a graduate degree or directly into the employment market. I think with a, a degree in psychology at the undergraduate level, a baccalaureate, I think it's very wise to go to graduate school because with a baccalaureate in psychology, it doesn't prepare you for a specific occupation, right? Yeah. Not really. Mm -hmm. so, um, so I think thinking about a master's degree or a PhD is uh, a very good idea. And to prepare for that, uh, the best way to get accepted is to have good grades and a good GRE score. Uh, so uh, some institutions look at just the last two years of your grades. Uh, some of them look at all four years. Um, but if if you've got, you know, if, if your grades are uh, in the C range, it's gonna be hard to get accepted to graduate school uh, almost wherever. Mm. Uh, if your average GPA is in the C range, that, it has to be at least B or most graduate schools uh, don't want graduate programs accepting students with lower than that. So that's kind of a cutoff in a sense. But, and then the GRE depends on the program, but they have cutoffs or um, brackets that they use to evaluate incoming students who are applying to uh, their graduate program. So you want to, if possible, practice the GRE, do well as well as possible in the GRE if, if that's the test that's required. Usually that's the test that's required for our mm -hmm. discipline. And, and so then if you, if you get accepted, then here's, and the other thing is even in the process of exploring these programs, um, if you're not sure which university to go to, it's perfectly fine to email a faculty member and say, I have been reading an article that you wrote uh, last year that was published, da, 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 and this is what it said, and this is, uh, I, I would like to just talk with you about that mm -hmm. for a little while. If that faculty member feels that you are really interested in their particular line of questioning and research, they might be kind of more uh, amenable to sponsoring you a little bit, to try mm -hmm. and help you get in the program. Uh, rather than just going at the whole process cold and not knowing anybody. And they will so, mentor you too. Yeah, they'll kind of help you do what you need to do to get accepted. And um, that happens in some cases. And so it's easy to do this because at any university you go on the directory, you find the faculty member's name, you look at their name, and then you click on the beta and it shows all their publications. You can go then and online access their publications, read the ones that look interesting to you that you would like to spend some of your graduate time studying, mm -hmm. and then um, contact the faculty member directly and talk to them about the question, you know, the line of research that they're doing and why you're so interested in that and how can, what advice do they have for you if you would like to get accepted to that program. That, that's what I would recommend. Yeah, that must be very, very helpful, helpful <clears throat> um, especially for our, like, um, for our situations, because both of us are a senior right now. Um, going back to instructional psychology, Elder, um, what do you think about the current education right now compared to the past, or like the way students learn right now? Are they more efficient, or do you have any kind of, idea how so are, are you thinking of university education or k-12 or what are you thinking um university or in yeah, general or, yeah 
Adults, adult yeah, learning. Adults. Mm -hmm. Adult learning has changed mm -hmm. uh, over the past several years, mostly because of the internet. And so um, the best way to explain this and how it's all happened is one day I was watching a football game with my grandchild mm -hmm. and he said, what does that letter on the back of the ref mean? Mm -hmm. And that S or that B, what, what does that mean? And I said, oh, it means that he's a specific kind of ref and he's watching these kinds of things. He's watching for offsides or whatever. And he says, yeah, but what does the letter stand for? And I said, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> That's hard so then, then my grandchild looked up at me and he said, well, grandpa, Google it, look it up. <laughs> I could have said to him, well, why don't you Google it? <laughs> so I Googled it and, and uh -huh. looked it up and I was, you know, went to Wikipedia and gave all the letters on the backs of reps. <laughs> and then I had to explain it. So this, this has been, this whole generation now, uh -huh. it's like, if I have a question right now, I can, I can Google that and I can find some answer. It may not be the most reliable, best answer, but I can find something on that topic almost instantly. That has changed because what mm -hmm. that's done is it's given people more access to knowledge. And access to knowledge is a huge, huge factor in education. If you look at the past, mm -hmm. there, were, there were sectors of the society that did not have access to, to knowledge. So um, the impoverished, mm -hmm. the disabled, um, minorities, and second language speakers, mm -hmm. And the list can go on. These people had such little access to knowledge. How did we expect them to gain an education? They didn't have access to it. Now we all have access to mm -hmm. an abundance of knowledge. Still, even with the pandemic, we've noticed that some homes do not have Wi Fi. Mm -hmm. So now here their children are getting homeschooled. I mean, they're getting schooled remotely on Zoom and they can't access Zoom. So this is serious. And now what do we do? We've got to get Wi-Fi into their house. Uh, so they'll have, quote, access to knowledge. Um, John Goodlad, a number of years ago, like 20 years ago, wrote a book called Access to Knowledge. And it was, mm -hmm. it was important to me as I read it because having had a lot of access to knowledge, I remember my, my parents were the first ones on the in our neighborhood to get a set of encyclopedias in our home. We had this huge set of encyclopedias, you know. <laughs> and then when technology came on the scene, when I was an adult, we were the first ones to have a computer in our entire neighborhood. I bought an Apple IIe, had that thing on the <laughs> desk, you know. <laughs> and, uh, everybody in the neighborhood wanted to come over. <laughs> <laughs> they were like checking it out. <laughs> they wanted to check it out. They wanted to use it for their own, you know, study and everything. So. Um, I've always had a lot of access to knowledge, but there are so many people who have not. And so mm -hmm. that's, that's changing now. And so how, how effective we are, how good we are at seeking our own answers, answers to our own questions, that is, I think, changing in the adult population. And that's really good. I mean, mm -hmm. because more people are actively seeking answers to questions and that's healthy when they stop doing that and we see it uh, in our society when they stop learning or we might say when they stop learning truth they are susceptible to conspiracy theories mm -hmm. to lies to misinformation mm -hmm. to all kinds of bad things that lead to nowhere good and so Helping people be seekers of truth, seekers always of what is right and good and true. That is really our goal. It should be our goal in, in the whole world right now because we've got problems throughout the world with people being swayed because of um, social media messages that are coming at them that now social media is having to monitor and censor because 
they are causing so much damage. Well, mm -hmm. they wouldn't cause damage if the person were discerning in the first place, right? Mm -hmm. it, these, are, these are adults. If this adult had the ability to think critically and to analyze knowledge and to decide what is true and what is not, what is misinformation and what is good information, we wouldn't have the problems that we're having right now. So some of these breaks or these gaps in our society mm -hmm. with access to knowledge have now been amplified uh, because of um, societal unrest, we might call it. True, true. So our major request right now is not seeking for more knowledge, but it's balancing the knowledge that we can have. We can have an access on. That's interesting. Right. We always want to be seeking knowledge, but we've got to be sure we're on a good track <laughs> seeking. <laughs> I think that's one of the reasons that we uh, have our problem right now in the world. Like we have that sort of knowledge, but we're not sure if it's uh, legit or is it uh, legit or not, or is it fake or not. That's why we need to make sure of all the knowledge that we receive in the internet. Exactly, Isaiah. That that is, I think it's one of our biggest problems right now in all of society. Um, people not being discriminating enough, trusting what somebody says. You look at the pandemic, all the misinformation, all the fears that are out yeah, there yeah. that are unjustified because they don't really understand it. Uh, and if they did understand it, those fears would be taken away. But no, they, they cling on to some um, rabble rousing piece of information that just gets them all worked up and angry and mm -hmm. fearful. And you say, sure. this, is, this is not what we ought to be doing. And particularly in the church, mm -hmm. we ought to be very discerning. And polarization is getting, getting, you know, uh, we are having more, we are being more polarized right now especially with different views, right? Yes, uh -huh. exactly. So yeah, that's, I think that's the, um, um, I think that, that's the importance of um, having or understanding this field to you. You are helping other students or other people to learn better and be a faster uh, learner. And with that other, um, we may, we can, like we'll be asking this question to you that, what are this, the major breakthrough in instructional psychology in the current situation for education right now? Okay, um, I'll answer that. One thing I wanted to add to the last conversation was yeah. uh, one of our vice presidents one day said, ignorance is our greatest enemy. Mm -hmm. So in other words, not knowing the truth, that's our greatest enemy in life. Mm -hmm. And people who go astray suffer from this. They're ignorant on things. They don't educate themselves well. And so then they go astray and they get taken down into uh, dangerous paths. So um, questions about breakthroughs in instructional psychology and technology. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Or I think most of them have come with technology in recent years, you know, so the use of technology in education and um, the very, um, medium that we are using right now mm. was invented by an instructional psychologist as well as a programmer, right? Zoom, uh, I haven't looked at the employees that Zoom has, but Zoom obviously has some instructional designers, definitely, mm. there's no question about it. Um, otherwise, this would not be as usable as it is and as effective as it is. Mm. So um, the programmers have a role to actually get the code right. But the programmers don't know anything about what the person should be seeing on the screen, the user interface, how to design that in a way that it will be user friendly. Those are all instructional psychology questions. So mm -hmm. um, I would say that those have been some of the important advances in recent years. Um, and technology has helped us in a lot of ways come to understand how people learn. Yeah. That, that people do not learn with one trial. Mm -hmm. They have to have repetition, <laughs> repetition. The Lord knows this, right? And that's why yeah. he, keep, he keeps repeating things in the scriptures. And he has his prophets keep repeating things. Mm -hmm. Say, why did President Nelson tell us again to repent? 
<laughs> that's good. So, uh, yeah, interesting. So the psychologists behind all of these technological stuff are all oh, mostly instru instructional technology. I've never known that before. Yeah, that's interesting. Yeah, because this this is a Zoom is an educational medium actually, and so they had to have some instructional designers uh, on their team um, to help develop it. So that somebody could say, well, where should we put that button so that it's easy to find, easy yeah. to interpret? Uh, yeah, that that they had to have some designers work on that. Programmers are not good at that. <laughs> yeah, I'm just wondering, Aldous, would speak of, about uh, with what we uh, talking about earlier with the pandemic. How does it? Uh, What's the position of, of our educational system right now? Like, how does the pandemic affect our educational system? Oh, it's in some ways been quite disastrous um, because I just heard the other day, this was the school superintendent in Clark County Schools in Nevada, a very large school district in Las Vegas. And he said, we are, we are going back to in-person schooling because during the past uh, several months, we have had an increasing number of youth suicides. So when I ta say disastrous, it's been disastrous for some people. Mm -hmm. uh, the interviewer said, do you think some of these suicides can be attributed to the pandemic? He said, the pandemic definitely has played a part in this. When, when some people become so isolated, mm -hmm. you'll notice that when they put you in prison and they say, for you, you're going in total isolation, right? <laughs> well, total isolation is a, a, an incredibly horrible punishment for a human being. Uh, that's why social media platforms have been so successful because we are social beings. Mm -hmm. And when you take the sociality out of life, you take the life out of the person the person has a hard time subsisting without social contact. And so um, in that way, it's been very troubling. In other ways, we've, I'm sure in the positive side, we've learned a lot about online learning. So one of, one of the articles that I wrote uh, a number of years ago, so this would have been uh, about 15 years ago. Mm -hmm. Uh, I wrote an article with Charles Graham on blended learning, we mm -hmm. called it. Some people call it hybrid learning, some people call it blended. And so this was one of the first articles of its kind on blended learning. It was kind of a definitional article to kind of define the field. The whole point of the article was when you have online education only, there are problems. People need face-to-face -face contact. Mm -hmm. They need in-person contact. It may not be all the time, but you need to uh, have some of that. When I taught the special education course at BYU Hawaii, mm -hmm. I talked with the department chair or with the dean there, and I said, I'm not going to be able to teach on Friday. It's a Monday, Wednesday, Friday class, and I can't teach on Fridays, or I'll have no time to prepare everything for all, all these religion classes we're teaching, because we, we were <laughs> teaching a lot of religion. <laughs> <laughs> I bet <laughs> we've never we've never taught so much in our life <laughs> and, and so uh, she said that I said I could I'll do the Friday class is going to be online so basically what I designed for that sped course was a blended course we met together Monday Wednesday and on Friday they did everything online oh that worked out I think extremely well and then when the pandemic came I had to put the whole course, uh, she asked me to teach it in spring. So I had to teach the whole course in spring online, but I was kind of already ready for it because I had done all those Friday classes. I just had to do the Monday, Wednesday ones, somewhat like I did the Friday ones and design mm -hmm. those for online learning. Uh, <clears throat> was the online section as good in, in that SPED course as the in-person? It lost a lot, I think, that, that getting together being together and learning together face to face, you can't, there's just no way you can replace that. However, I told my wife one day after the course was over in spring, I told her, I said, the darn thing is, I think 
my spring class might have learned more than the winter class. <laughs> it was totally online, but they, they did the assignments. They were very diligent. Um, so I was surprised actually at how much learning. We can, get, we can get a lot of learning going on with online courses that are designed well. And so uh, this whole issue of uh, the pandemic and education, it's taught us that we absolutely need in-person contact. We need face-to-face -face contact. We need to be together. Mm -hmm. But it's also taught us, I think, the tremendous potential of online learning. And if we are smart enough in the future someday, I am, I am convinced that in the future, there will be more online learning than there was prior to the pandemic. Mm -hmm. Because teachers will say, well, there's no need to come to class to get this. Uh, they don't need to come and hear me lecture to them for <laughs> an hour or whatever. I can, seriously, you know, there's no reason for that. Yeah. We, can do, we can do that online. Yeah. But when we get together, we're going to be working in collaborative groups. We're going to be doing group work, task-oriented, uh, creative work that you can't do alone. When, when that realization comes to people, then they're going to say, okay, this portion of the course would, be, would go well online. This portion of the course, we've got to get together. I used to tell faculty when I was helping faculty at BYU Provo, when I was in the Teaching and Learning Center, I would say, you've got to decide why are you getting together? What is the purpose of your meeting in class together? What is there that you're doing there that you couldn't do, that, te that students couldn't do by themselves alone? Because if they can do everything by themselves alone, there, there's not a whole lot of purpose in getting together for adult learners. But if they come together and they say, well, I've, I've got to get together with my team that I'm working on this project on, oh, this makes sense. And then the teacher can go around and help each of the teams with their projects and answer questions that are specific to them. No, that makes a lot of sense to get together. Mm -hmm. uh, but if, if they're just sitting there listening, uh, it's kind of like, what is the point of this? I <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah. Like, yeah. What, like what you said, Alder, that there should be something or there should be some activity when you go face to face. Like, based on my experience, I learn more in classroom if there are a lot of activities compared to learning, doing activities just by myself. Totally. Mm -hmm. And that's what we really tried to do with Come Follow Me curriculum for youth, which you all experienced. Um, and Come Follow Me for Youth was much more activity oriented, getting learners to participate and contribute more than just sitting there listening to a teacher lecture for 40 minutes. So um, that's, that was one of the whole points of Come Follow Me. And now look at Come Follow Me for adults. <laughs> really, <laughs> it is the point because we're doing it all, you know, on our own or like my wife and I, we're yeah, we do team learning. <laughs> it's collaborative efforts for it's collaborative. Each, yeah, each yeah. member of the group. Yeah, cool. Um, yeah, other. We'll be asking about your experiences. So this is the final part of this interview. Okay. Um, what is one of your memorable experience you have with having this instructional psychology career? You know, I've I've had um, so many great experiences. I tell my wife all the time, I had so much fun as a faculty member. I, here's one little experience that comes to mind at university faculty. So I became director of the faculty, uh, the, the learning and Center for Teaching and Learning at BYU. You call it Center for Learning and Teaching there. It's a better name at BYU, Provo, at BYU Hawaii. Um, but in the Center for Teaching and Learning at BYU Provo, I looked at, we had we had 5% of our faculty, uh, we got 2000 faculty or something. So we, we had like a hundred of them who were getting horrible evaluations from students. Mm -hmm. Students were saying, uh, this is one of the worst courses I've ever taken. <laughs> this professor is disorganized. I don't even know what we were supposed to be learning. I learned nothing in this course. This was awful, terrible, <laughs> wasteful, horrible things, you know. And I said, okay, these are the faculty who are, who are crashing and burning. You know, these are faculty. Now, maybe the faculty, before they came to university, they were employed by a pharmaceutical company and they went to be hired in the chemistry department. 
they've never taught a day in their life. <laughs> they, don't know, they don't know anything about making a test. They don't know anything about uh, creating a syllabus. They, they just don't know how to teach a college course. And so uh, they find themselves in very deep water quickly. And so I went to the vice president and I said, think what would happen if we could help these hundred faculty do better. This would, this would be a monumental thing. It's easy to help a quite a good faculty member to improve a little bit. They're so motivated. They're getting all kinds of positive feedback from students, et cetera. But what about these faculty who are getting slammed by students every semester, uh, getting told that this was the most worthless course they've ever taken. <laughs> that this is hard to get motivated. They kind of they kind of crawl into a hole sometimes and say, I don't even want to do that. You know, I just, I'll do my research and forget the teaching part. But they can't do that at BYU Provo. They have to be, they have to teach well or they can't really stay at the university for very long. So um, he liked this idea. So we went about it and helped them. We found some ways, I won't go into it all because it would take too long, but found some ways to help them. At the end of this thing, we found that uh, quite a number of these faculty members who used to be rated the worst in this, in the whole university were now rated as among some of the very best. Huge change. And so what I came out of that and I said, small changes in your teaching can make big differences in learning. You don't have to transform your personality or become a whole new teacher, new professor, whatever. Small changes can lead to very big changes for student learning if you do these things. And so eventually they got way better. My other experience that was um, more, even much more fulfilling in, in many ways was helping to develop Come Follow Me for Youth. Oh, you helped them? You helped so, them. so I was kind of, um, I was kind of at times, I was helping spearhead, I was kind of directing that effort yeah. uh, because it was involved the young men, young women and Sunday school youth classes. So and seminary. So I was kind of the interface person between all those mm -hmm. at times and, and helping that curriculum get developed. Mm -hmm. It was a challenging process in all kinds of ways, um, but probably my most fulfilling ever. And so one time we were observing classes in Mexico. This is in Oaxaca, Mexico. Uh -huh. um, they have a temple in Oaxaca. It's, a, it's kind of south of Mexico City quite a ways. Um, not a not a big city and not not a lot of wealth in this city. And I told my wife after this class that I went to observe. I said, "That is probably the best youth teaching I have ever observed anywhere in the world in the church." This teacher was masterful, but she was doing everything that we had been hoping for with "Come Follow Me." She got her students to participate in a way that was so meaningful. They were bearing testimony to each other. Uh, these two guys on the back row were both in tears. Uh, the one was so happy that he had helped him come back to the church. Um, he looked over at him, he said, without you, I would not be here today because you helped me come back to church and I was going down a bad path and you helped me come back. I thought, oh, this is what we want in youth classes all over the church, you know. Um, but it couldn't have happened without a teacher who was, she was not interested in lecturing these kids. She would ask questions and they would come forth with these answers that would then lead to further uh, questions and more great answers. And I thought, oh, this is what we were hoping for in this curriculum. And it was, you know, it was the first curriculum delivered online in the church ever in its history. Uh, it changed the way that curriculum got delivered, the youth curriculum, and of mm -hmm. course now the adult curriculum. And now we've got LDS tools, and we've got, I mean, it's all these other uh, technology tools that uh, just kind of came about all after that, and some of them as a result of that. So uh, that was just really a fulfilling experience. I felt like I was putting my my discipline to mm -hmm. work, but also in using the faith that we needed to have to help that happen. 
yeah, that must be very, very full, full feeling for you out there. So just to be clear, are you one of the developers or contributors for the Come Follow Me program? So the Come Follow Me for Youth? Yeah. Yes. So, and we had, we had, the, yes, the Come Follow Me for Youth, I was, I was kind of right there in the middle of it the whole time. Um, so, um, and it was released in 2012, I think. And so I got released in 2014. So it had been out for two years when, so, and by that time we were working on the Come Follow Me for adults, but that took another five years to be released. So that came out during Brother Collister's time, mm -hmm. but um, we worked on the Come Follow Me for adults as well. And so it was, it was really, it's been very rewarding to see all of that happen because I think gospel learning and teaching is different now than it was uh, 20 years ago. Yeah, I really like what you said out there. Like, we, need, we really need to learn how to teach other people because our knowledge would be uh, useless if we can't teach it to other people. Totally. Yeah, you learn this on a mission, right? Yeah. Uh, how important it is to and, and it's and you learn on a mission how challenging it is to teach right? you know <laughs> yeah it people, is. <laughs> all those investigators that don't want to that's like, right do the things that you need to do <laughs> okay uh, yeah th 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 that is right other uh with all of those experience that you had what advice would you give to our listeners or currently or like will be listening to this podcast or in this field yeah so my my advice is Aim high. Aim high. <laughs> Aim high. Whatever level of education you're thinking of getting right now, aim a little higher. <laughs> uh, you, could, you can probably do more than you think. You can probably achieve more than you believe you can in your life. Um, because the Lord's with you. Mm -hmm. The Lord will help you. And so all of us alone are not very effective or... Uh, terrifically great but with the lord's help we can do all kinds of things and so if you're thinking about graduate school think about it really hard and, and go for it and if you get rejected sometime that doesn't matter i got rejected one time and then i got accepted it, it doesn't matter um you keep pressing for your goals that you believe the lord would want you to pursue and the lord will help you uh, that's that's my deep belief, my deep testimony that the Lord will help you in whatever righteous desire you have. And so many right now of your righteous desires have to be framed around education because education opens doors. It opens lots of doors and not just for employment, but for future learning and for the health of your marriage and all kinds of things and for your long term um, faithfulness in the church. Uh, the more educated you are, the more likely you are to be faithful all of your life. It's very interesting in the church. So in other churches, sometimes the more education people get, the more they leave their church, not in our church. Uh, <laughs> the more you learn, the stronger you are in the church. This is interesting. So because we believe in learning all we can learn and throughout our life. So my that's my advice, aim high. Um, Keep your goals uh, always up there and reachable, but high. You want them high. How wonderful, Elder. Thank you so much for that. Um, for, for our final question, we always ask this to our, to our guests. So this question would be, what does psychology mean to your life? What does psychology mean to my life? Yeah. Actually, it's helped me raise my children. It's helped me have, I think, a better relationship, the best relationship I can with my wife. It's helped me work in groups when everyone is thinking differently. It helped me in my church leadership, leadership positions uh, as a stake president or a mission president or temple president because I had some background knowledge about how people uh, learn and also how emotions affect human behavior and so uh, understanding because psychology is, is really the study of self-regulation the study of emotions uh, 
and and how your emotional health can affect the rest of your life. So psychology has helped me in direct ways. When I got on a mission to be a mission president, I told my wife one day, I said, wow, I feel sorry for all those other mission presidents that didn't have my particular background in structural psychology, <laughs> because all they're doing is training. That's all a mission president does is train. I mean, he, can, he does interviews, and even the interviews he's training, right? So it's like, I have, my whole background is in training. So one day we went to do a big lesson. We had to get PVC pipe to build this great big structure we wanted to do you know, for a zone conference. And we go to this hardware store and he says, oh, are you putting in a sprinkler system? I said, no, we're not putting in a sprinkler system. We're doing a training for missionaries of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. <laughs> they must he be said, wondering. They must have been said, wondering. What? <laughs> what kind of training are you doing? <laughs> but we're that's interesting though. How to do how to do plumbing. <laughs> you know, we, we, we built this big structure and put signs on it and had them take the signs off and put the signs back on. It, it was a very effective training. And but I wouldn't we wouldn't have thought of those things. My wife was in teaching also, and uh, we wouldn't have thought of those things if I didn't have a background in uh training and, and helping people learn. So amazing out there. We are really, really learning a lot from you thank you so much elder, elder for the things that we we learned from you today um for our listeners um how can we get through to you or like how can we message you where can we find you elder well you can <laughs> so the email i usually use yeah uh you you got through me through outlook yeah but, uh, the one i usually use is rt at gmail.com so mm -hmm. R-T-O-S-G-U-T-H-O-R-P-E at gmail.com. Uh, they can email me all they want. Um, <laughs> and I will be happy to respond. Um, and, or they can text me, whatever they want. Um, yeah. Yeah. So, um, but if they're thinking about a degree in psychology or a program, or whatever, I'd be happy to talk to them. Um, yeah. Yeah. Thank you, Elder. Yeah. We'll... I, I, I must say, I miss BYU Hawaii. I miss <laughs> all of you. Uh -huh. I miss particularly the students. It's like when I retired from BYU, somebody said, uh -huh. well, do you miss it? And BYU Provo. And I said, I miss the students mostly. Oh. <laughs> That's what I mostly miss. I don't miss some of the administrative meetings, <laughs> but I miss the students a lot. So we just had a great time when we were there, and uh, I hope you'll give our love to everybody. Yeah, I could really say that you really love teaching others as good Yeah, so we thank do. you for your uh, skills that you uh, give unto us. Sure. Yeah. Thank you so much, Elder. Mahalo for watching and listening to our podcast. We are hoping to see you on the next podcast. Bye-bye. <laughs>